What's going on guys, Carmine here, and I just got done watching the third episode a second time. Now, I like to do this because it helps me form my thoughts a bit more, because during the first viewing, you can miss a couple of things here and there. Now, I will say this, the episode was definitely better than the second episode by a long shot, and I find this a little weird and exciting because every single episode has been better than the last. This time, I'll have to sum it up to the acting. Jamie, Alaria, Cersei, and Elena at the end? My god, these people are in top form this season and it shows. This episode has got to be one of my favorites throughout the series in general, not just this season. I will however say that I had some nitpicky issues here and there. While we did cover some of my wish lists this episode, it wasn't quite what I imagined it to be, and if you've been following me for a while then you know exactly what I'm talking about. And as always, the sixth episode of the Game of Thrones podcast will premiere sometime this week, and that will be on Preston's channel. Be sure to follow me on Twitter or Facebook for all updates on that. And if you haven't already heard, I'm doing a small giveaway for the Hand of the King pin. Details on that towards the end of the video. But with all this out of the way, let's get to the review. First, let's start with Sam, and I will say the one thing I'm loving about this season with Sam is that we're barely getting any scenes of Gilly. Thank you, showrunners. Thank you so much. You finally granted my birthday wish. I will say this. I was not feeling the whole meetup between Sam and Jorah, and you've all made your feelings known on that last episode review. I get it. You guys like their team up, and I must remain with my opinion on it being a little lame. But I will say this. It did grow on me. I really did like their little scene this episode, and it's a shame that we didn't get more of them. Yeah, I know I hated it last time, and I, I still kind of do, but if you're gonna have it, if you're gonna have them together, then have more of a bonding moment, at least, you know? Maybe have Jorah tell Sam a story about when he was younger and his dad did something cool, and Sam can say, oh yeah, he did that for me too. Something. I don't know, maybe I'm being too picky here, but Sam and Jorah really did grow on me a little, and it's a shame to see him go so quickly. Sam, on the other hand, I feel bad for. He did basically just fucking cure Grayscale, and the Archmaester isn't giving him a chain for that? Come on, that's such bullshit. But, but at least there wasn't anything gross coming out of his scenes this episode, so props for that. Also, maybe it's my inner germaphobe coming out a little, but I hope there's a deleted scene where Sam goes to the bathroom and scrubs the hell out of his hand after shaking Jura's hand. That would be hilarious. But the Sam stuff this episode was pretty okay. I just wanted a bit more between him and Jorah, and maybe... A reward for curing a disease that has plagued this world for fucking hundreds of years. On his first attempt! Come on, dude! Give him a hug or something. But let's see what you guys had to say about it. On Twitter, no longer human says, The resolution of Jorah's grayscale plotline was completely anticlimactic and unfulfilling. Didn't feel like Sam's character went anywhere. Sam's character, uh... The guy gets saved by pretty boys and wolves. His character is reading books and banging girls from Jersey. That's his entire existence, and that's exactly why I was so against it. Him curing Jorah really doesn't do much for the story, other than free up Jorah to go back to Danny. Then what was the point in giving him grayscale anyways? Before the season began, some people thought that they were going to use Jorah as a biological weapon against the Night King, or that Jorah will somehow be invisible to the Whites due to the grayscale disease, and be able to face off against the Night King in single combat, instead of having to fight hundreds of undead Whites to get to him. Yeah, that was an actual theory some people had, because the grayscale was too far in, and I guess the theory here is that somehow it concealed his heartbeat, so the Whites didn't consider him a living person or whatever, and just ignore him. Reminds me of that scene from World War Z where the zombies ignore everybody with a deadly disease. Those were the theories, but whatever. Just nothing really came of it other than giving the actors some time off. It's why I was so against it from the beginning. But like I said, I did enjoy that last few scenes of Sam and Jorah together. It was nice. I just wish they had more screen time. Next, let's talk about the North, and in my opinion, it was the weakest part of this episode. Sansa in charge is just... okay. She didn't stand out too much, which is a shame because that could have been delivered with such potential. In my opinion, it would have been super funny if she was way more of an effective leader than Jon was. But all the North did this episode was set up Peter being shadier than he, how he has been so far, and Bran's return, which also left me wanting a bit more than what we got. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten enough of him this season for me to warrant a full opinion on him. He seems different, and by different, I mean he's acting kind of... kind of like the AI from A Space Odyssey. Seriously, go back to that scene with him and Sansa, I'm not kidding. You're Lord of Winterfell now. I can never be Lord of Winterfell. I can never be Lord of anything. 
It, it, it was super weird, but at least we got Bran back, and I'm glad we have him back. Not because I like Bran, but because I like the potential flashbacks and visions we can get from him. However, despite him finally returning and poor Mira not even getting a single chance to do anything, Winterfell this episode was a little flat for me, which is okay because this episode mainly focused on the war efforts in the South. But let's see what you guys had to say about it. From Patreon, Terry says, And now that Bran is back and he doesn't want to be Lord of Winterfell, what role will he play? Will he just sit around and have visions all the time? His main role for these last two seasons will be to serve as Jon's advisor and soldier in the Winter War. The fact that he can warg and scout out troop movements makes him very important, and the fact that he knows so much also makes him an important war power, which is the name I've given to those in the show that have the potential to turn the tide of battle. But I will say that Bran sitting around is all he can do, and the most interesting thing to come from him this season is the visions. and. That's what we still want, like visions of Rhaegar and Lyanna and even some of the White Walker slash Night King background. I'm still curious as to whether the Night King is actually a Stark or a Bolton, but the one thing about Bran that really, really interests me is whether or not he'll stay in Winterfell in the very last episode of the final season. I don't want to think that Bran is actually the Three-Eyed Raven but as a child and that time is in a loop because that would be kind of dumb, but at the same time it wouldn't surprise me. I'm just really curious, will he be staying at Winterfell after the war is over, or will he go back beyond the wall to where he was with the Raven? Hmm. Now let's head on over to King's Landing, and there isn't much to say about it other than it was absolutely amazing. Euron parading his prisoners through the streets, and then later talking shit to Jaime was amazing. Uh, they really did bring his character up from nothing and made him one of the best this season. But I think the main highlight here was the Cersei Ilaria scene. Now normally I hate Ilaria because the showrunners have decided to give her all the cool stuff to do instead of the original intended character of Duran, but I've got to say, this episode, the actress was great, and Cersei as well. I will say I'm going to miss Tyene Sand for obvious reasons, she is my favorite Sand Snake, but Cersei was brutal this episode with that kiss of death which then she goes and kisses Jamie with. I know a couple of you guys are making jokes with me on if Cersei didn't completely wipe her lips and just full-on doom Jamie. <laughs> but, but I think my favorite King's Landing scene has got to be her conversation with the representative from the Iron Bank. I believe his name is Tycho. The reason I like it so much is because it shows Cersei being strategic and a queen. She is playing her dues while at the same time forming a semi-alliance with the Iron Bank to ensure that they don't support Danny's claim. It's strategic and very clever, and this is something I've wanted to see from Cersei in power. Her acting like a queen, kicking ass, and taking names. Cersei thus far has not disappointed me one single bit this season. The actress, as always, has been on point, the character feels the way she should, and she's making smart moves and behaving like we all know Cersei would when it comes into power. Couldn't ask for any more, but let's see what you guys thought. On Twitter, Daniel says, I like how they aren't overpowering Danny and giving Cersei a fighting chance. I completely agree, and I'm glad they went this route because, and I don't know about you guys, I found the Battle of Marine when Danny came in rather boring. Dragons are cool and all, but watching three fire-breathing lizards come in and fuck everybody up can only be entertaining for a little bit before it gets stale. The showrunners have switched things up a bit, and I'm and have shown us that dragons aren't everything. But some of you guys have also said it's Danny's fault for not taking King's Landing immediately. Danny doesn't know about Cersei's anti-dragon weapons, so she's lucky there that she didn't attack it immediately without seeing it in action first. And not only that, we still don't know how many of those things Cersei has. If she's smart, she'll line up the walls with them. On Facebook, Izzy says, I can't believe how insane everyone on Danny's War Council is. Casterly Rock is literally on the other side of the continent to where Dragonstone is. Tyrion's strategy just trapped half of Danny's ground forces on the other side of Westeros to spare his siblings a gruesome death. So what Izzy is referring to here is now how some fans believe that Tyrion is trying to get Cersei and Jaime to surrender instead of having Danny's forces or dragons kill them. Any advisor worth their salt would never tell her to go attack a target far away and instead tell her to attack King's Landing and lay siege to it. I get that you don't want innocent people to die, so you'd let your own forces die for people who don't even know or care about you. Not only that, but sending most of her ground forces towards the target on the other side of the continent, something that would take more than a week to reach if the winds are favorable, is dumb. The funniest thing about Danny's forces is that arguably the best character on the show is the worst strategist. I love it. Everyone loves Tyrion, but no one is loving Tyrion right now, especially if you're a Danny fan. And before we move on to the meeting of Ice and Fire, let's discuss the battles of this episode. We got 
2, kinda. The battle for Casterly Rock was well done, I did enjoy the fighting, but I will say I am a little disappointed with how Casterly Rock looks. The artist's interpretation of it makes it look way more badass than just a generic, medieval looking castle on top of a hill. And while we're on the topic of castles, Highgarden, the Tyrell capital, is not three buildings overlooking a couple of trees. My wish list for the entire series is to see these castles and how great they are, and this is just very underwhelming. The artist's interpretation, once again, is much better, and I don't get why they, ju they just didn't go with that, at least. Every single castle we've seen so far from Westeros has been very awesome and pretty unique, but these seem very poorly done. I wasn't a fan of it. Not only that, but I understand that the battle for Highgarden couldn't have been done in full, but the Tyrell forces have more men than the Lannisters do. I wasn't too keen on them taking it so quickly, but what made up for it was the last scene between Jaime and Elena. The Queen of Thorns went out like a boss, and the fact that she revealed it was her who killed Joffrey? Perfect. Absolutely mwah, perfect. The acting between these two? This scene needs no words. Definitely going into one of my best for the entirety of the series. And last, we get to Danny and John meeting up. I was so afraid of this meeting because I thought the showrunners were going to go far in their fanfic approach, and I was pleasantly surprised. Surprised because it felt exactly how I thought it would. They're both hesitant to ally with each other, but also not backing down. Danny, as always, being a little arrogant in how she comes off, and Jon Snow being Jon Snow. If you noticed, he was failing to keep eye contact and kind of sucked in his approach to her, and I liked it. Jon is a shitty negotiator, and Davos really didn't help him too much, but he did what he could. We also got what I wanted, and that was a conversation with these two alone. Their scenes together didn't disappoint me, and I will say I wasn't expecting Danny to ask for forgiveness. That was good. And their conversation was also frustrating, but in a good way. Jon is keeping his focus on the White Walker threat while Danny wants to secure her birthright. At one point, I almost yelled at my screen to say, Woman, listen to him! Also, I love how Missandei names all of Danny's titles, and Davil just comes in and goes, Yeah, this is Jon Snow. He, uh, was proclaimed King of the North two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, John. I got you covered. <clears throat> yeah, this is Jon Snow, King of the North, Night's Watch deserter, wildling liberation leader, wields the fabled plot armor of destiny, and eats pussy like a champ. I also like this scene because there was just the right amount of humor, right amount of history shared, right amount of Tyrion and Davos breaking in, and I like that they stayed in character. There wasn't a love spark immediately. I'm still hoping they don't get together, because I find it more realistic for Jon to like marry some random background extra than to get with Danny, but that's just me. And I think one of the most interesting things about the Dragonstone part were the scenes between Jon and Tyrion on the cliff. Someone told me they got a vibe of Ned and Robert from season 1, and I gotta agree in a, at a, in a sense. Even though Jon and Tyrion only knew each other for a very, very short time, not only that, but Tyrion and Benjen spoke more than Tyrion and Jon, but hey, whatever. I still like the chemistry and camaraderie between these two. The other really cool part was the alone time between Varys and Melisandre. That was creepy, and I hope they don't have to. Hope we don't have to lose Varys next season because I really do like having him around. He adds some flavor and intrigue to his scenes, and he's always welcome. But overall, the Dragonstone scenes this episode was solid. But let's see what you guys had to say. On Patreon, Ro asks. Do you think if Danny knew that Jon was Rhaegar's son, she would support his claim to the Iron Throne? No, she would not, and if she were wise, she'd have him killed immediately if she found out. His claim definitely threatens hers, bastard or not, because we all know, you know, the male usually goes over the female in terms of claim. Not only that, but the way she is written in the show, she is a strong, independent woman who needs no man, mm-mm. Not only that... She can't even enter a Burger King without having Missandei shout out all her titles. But no, I, I, I don't think she'd support anybody's claim to that thing, and I think she said it best herself this episode. She went through a lot of bullshit just to get to sit on that throne, which is why I believe she'll refuse it in the end. King McKay, who by the way is a great Game of Thrones YouTuber, definitely check him out. He says, All the hate I got from my 5 plus videos saying Danny was going to lose in the beginning, look at me now. Yeah, I'm still shocked, King. Cersei, Cersei out of all people, is doing, doing this, which means you... This means that it won't happen in the books. The tragedy of her character is to try and be a badass schemer, but fail at it completely. Every single plan she's ever had has failed, and that is why she is so interesting to me. But I love how the one thing keeping Danny down is the dumb moves. You should have had the Greyjoys and the Unsullied laid siege to King's Landing while the Dothraki swept up any reinforcing army coming to help out along the lands of the surrounding city. No. 
Not only that, but someone also made a good point. On Facebook, Namir says, All of this could have been avoided had Danny sailed towards Dorne instead of Dragonstone. Yeah, Dragonstone is a nice stepping stone for uh, an invasion, but had they landed in Dorne, the Dornish soldiers could have supported the Tyrell forces with the combination of the Dothraki horsemen, and they could have swept up Cersei's supporters from the south and troops just going up towards King's Landing. It'd be more logical thing to do, you know, to land there instead of an island with no food. But then again, everything revolves around John and Danny meeting up, so if she did land in Dorne, she could have never met up with him. So, there you go, we couldn't have that. But overall, the episode was solid, and I really did enjoy it a lot. My biggest disappointments this episode were the lackluster castles, disappointing Tyrell forces, and Winterfell being a little meh. Also, I can't get over how insane Bran's random and quite douchey line of, Hey Sansa, haven't seen you in a while. By the way, that wedding night when you married that awful person, you look good. I just, I just can't get over how funny and fucked up that was. Also, if you felt like I left some things out of my review, don't worry. I'll be discussing this episode more in depth on the next episode of the Game of Thrones podcast, so look forward to that. I'm also doing a giveaway for the Hand of the King pin. All you have to do for a chance to enter is follow me on Twitter or Facebook and comment below. But like I said, this episode was good. However, leave your thoughts below, let me know what you thought of it, show me some love, and hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time. Baba Booey.